Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Revolutionary Daydreams. My name is Nicholas Roman Lewis, and I'm happy to have, literally have back with uh, us today, uh, my friend and filmmaker and documentarian, Hugo Perez. Welcome, Hugo. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm glad uh, summer's finally here. I'm doing a lot of editing, but also a lot of walking around, and so it's nice, nice to sit down and talk to you. So you are physically located in New York City. You're in Brooklyn. Where, where are you in Brooklyn? Uh, I'm in Bushwick, Brooklyn, which is a, a blighted post-apocalyptic landscape, which somehow is also really an amazing neighborhood to be in. Lots of artists are here, great food. Uh, not a lot of people, you know, especially on a, on a Sunday. And it's, it's really nice to be able to walk around and you know, not have to confront crowds of people. Wow, wow, and that was even before before the pandemic. So look, let's just really get into it. I could talk to you, you know, for, for hours on end. So I wanna try to frame our conversation today around a few, a few things. So generally, when I was thinking about you and your work uh, and the theme of what we do here at Revolutionary Daydreams, uh, you easily fit into this topic of art and revolution. And um, even I would say art and resistance, if we start to look further in your work, uh, that's generally then personally, you have, you're Cuban American and you have a family history that has dealt with, you know, revolution and having to leave, leave Cuba. Uh, your work, some of the things I'd like to put on the table recently, about a year and a half ago, you um, ventured out into your first art installation, which was Book Burn, Library of Books Burned with George Peck. And that was featured at the Museum of Jewish, Jewish Heritage in New York. And most notably, your, one of your um, award-winning document, documentaries, uh, Neither Memory Nor Magic, uh, about the poet Miklos Radnoti, you know, uh, who um, was killed in the Holocaust, uh, you know, deals with this as well. So I just want to, you know, j just jump in here and you as a filmmaker living in New York City, looking at the time we are now. So we're in a pandemic world, which unfortunately is not going away, no matter what anyone says. And then also Black Lives Matter. And then in this bigger conversation, that people are having around the world with, you know, anti-black or uh, racism, but in, in, a, in a really this kind of notion of, you know, humanity, right? And people coming out and marching. So just let's have that conversation. You, you as a filmmaker, how are you viewing that through your lens? Well, I, I, for me, this is a fascinating time. I mean, and, and a time also filled with a lot of tragedy and pain uh, but as an artist, it, it's also, it's very exciting because we live in, in a time when we don't know what's going to happen, mm -hmm. you know, what the outcome of anything is going to be. I mean, it's, it's, I feel like a lot of times in life, we're all in cruise control. We, you know, we understand that the world is going to function as it does and that things are going to be the same and there aren't any surprises. And now we live in a time when every day is a surprise. And, and so... So for some people, I think that's hard to deal with. For me, it's it's uh, it's interesting because I feel like I I um, I don't know. I have my eyes open in a, in a different sort of way, and you walk out the door and you just don't know like what what is today going to bring? You know, how is it going to affect the world? How is it going to affect me? Um, and I think that that's an that's an interesting place to be, you know, because it forces you to kind of live in the moment. And yeah, and, and living in the moment is is a really interesting place when you're working or creating because you're not hung up. I mean, so much of the time we're hung up on like, how is this going to turn out? Is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? Mm -hmm. You know, to you know, right now it's just like, you know, this is what I'm going to do today. You know, and tomorrow you wake up and like, this is what I'm going to do today. You know, and and you're not so hung up on the long term, or at least I'm not. And I'm just focused on like the work that's in front of me today. Um, well, there's definitely an immediacy, right? So if nothing else, 
what's happening now, and particularly if you're an artist or creative, there is an immediacy in trying to get your voice out there. Um, and the flip side, people actually listening to it. So if we're trying to find any type of, you know, positivity that's coming out of this, I, I would definitely say that. Hundred percent agree with you that. Um, yeah, that first. I mean, the things that I'm working on tend to be longer term projects. Um, I have one thing that I'm working on that is is something of this moment, and that I would like to fi you know finish, you know, in while we're still in this very long moment. Uh, but you're right that that people are paying attention, and it's amazing. You know, um, I mean, every day, like I. I get sent things to, you know, I mean, links and images and words uh, and videos. And there's, there's so much exciting um, movement going on um, with, you know, with Black Lives Matter, uh, the political situation in this country. A lot of uh, communities or, or groups of people that were, you know, not really that active before all of a sudden, I mean, like younger people, you know, you're really seeing them kind of like on the front lines now. Um, and you're also seeing that, that people of color um, getting a, a much bigger platform, you know, to, to, to speak to the world than we've ever seen, I think, you know? I mean, exactly, you know, talking about that platform, for me, it's like pe people are listening now, right? And so there's a bit of fatigue that goes into it as well because, and it's a double-edged sword, right? People have literally spent their careers, their lives working on something, talking about trying to get, educate and, and not being listened to, and sometimes not even being listened to, but like diminished, demolished, right? Because of what they're um, discussing and trying to, how, how they're trying to educate. So there's this, you know, kind of tug that's going on now that I think is quite necessary, but it's actually difficult. So, you know. There's, there's a lot of really interesting things going on. You know, like it's like, like things that for years nobody wanted to budge on. I mean, the Confederate flag, right? You know, 150 years. And it's like, oh, we don't want to take it down. It's like, okay, we're taking it down. Yeah, you're, you know, you're right. <laughs> I mean, Aunt, Aunt Jemima, right? Yeah. You know, like, what's the problem with Aunt Jemima? You know, like, what's the big deal? And like, you know, it's like, yeah, we got to get rid of Aunt Jemima, you know? But this is the thing with that. They already know. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, no, I know. Yeah, yeah, let's get rid of Aunt Jemima. We don't have to have a conversation because you already know. And you knew all along, right? It's just amazing, like, how, how fast a lot of these things. It's because, yeah, like, they, because it's been clear to everybody for decades, you know, like, yeah, this is wrong. We should probably change it, but it's the brand, you yeah. know, money. Like, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to keep getting my money and it doesn't matter if some people are offended or even, um, you know, it, 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 it has a negative impact on their actual life as long as, you know, but anyway, that's not your art. Thank God. <laughs> but it's interesting because we live in a moment where, um, people can no longer rely on the old arguments, you know, um, that have kept certain things in place for a long time. You know, it's just like, this is, it's like a for a cultural forest fire, which is burning out like a lot of stuff that um, should have been gone years ago. Exactly. That's a really good way to put it. Put I mean, there's also, you know, there's the flip side of it is that, you know, sometimes, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, people are talking about canceling, the breakfast club right or you know like for, for certain things and there may be a certain point we have to let i mean i mean confederate flag you know obviously but then when we get to certain like movies and tv shows then i think we have to like understand they come from a certain time um well i mean i i think the thing is to can we have the conversation about it can we have the honest conversation about it so you and i happen to be college classmates from Yale University, and we also happened to go be in Calhoun College. And Calhoun College was uh, Calhoun was a slave owner extraordinaire, and also somebody who I think wrote laws and was really invested in keeping that 
system, right? Of enslavement. Bad guy, yeah. Thank you, Hugo. Bad guy. So, you know, they changed the name. Uh, and we now have a choice of if we're, can we, they changed it to um, Pauli Murray. Pauli Murray College, right? Yeah, Pauli Murray. Grace Hopper. Grace Hopper, sorry, Grace Hopper. Nicholas, Grace, you should know this. I know, all right, I should know. Well, I'm gonna tell you why I don't know this. Well, not that I know this, why maybe it's not at the top of my head. Because in that, this is why it's a conversation. So now when we come, there's no conversation about the responsibility of the university of what they um, were part of, right? For all those years, you take the name away and there's no, okay, this name is no longer here and we're going to have a course or we're going to have something that explains what we were complicit in. No, we're going to remove the name, give a new name, and we're going to forget that this, this all happened. And so my thing is when people ask me, Where'd you, where, what college are you in? I'm like, I was in Calhoun because I want people to know that, uh, that until a couple years ago, everyone was complicit in having this uh, racist uh, slave owner's name, you know, over everything. And we, we didn't graduate, Hugo, in like 1923. This was like, you know, until a few years ago. Right. And all the smart intellectuals, all the people who've gone through Yale, like nobody said time is up now. No. OK, so I have this. So when we're talking about getting rid of Aunt Jemima and all this stuff, I'm like, let's have those real conversations, because, as you know, and this is a good segue, if you don't know about history, it's doomed to repeat itself. And that is my whole thing with that. I know it was a long winded way, but that's what I'm getting at. If we don't know why this came about and we just try to erase it in the middle of the night, that stuff is still there. So speaking of that, your work, um, I was moved by one of your earlier pieces and maybe you can help set the stage so that people, um, we'll put links to, so people can find your work um, in, in the comments, but uh, Neither Memory Nor Magic was a documentary about a poet and his life uh, that was ended during the Holocaust. So that, that work, obviously, time period, that is in the what, late 30s, early 40s. And then you have, and that kind of speaks for itself, right? But you can talk a little bit about it. Then you have this new, newer piece, an art installation, uh, a book burn that deals with all of these books that were, you know, said by the state to be, you know, bad books, got to burn them, whatever they, you know, not, not fit for society, so on and so forth. And I know that you, that came about, you and George Peck uh, worked on that and basically uh, inspired as kind of a resistance to some of the sentiments and things that you were seeing in, 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 in media. So can you maybe talk about you know, how those things have an influence now or what their impact is now? Because un unfortunately, we can't say it's in the past. Well, uh, Another Memory or Magic, uh, you know, is a documentary that tells the story of Mikola Shrednoti, a Hungarian poet killed in the Holocaust, uh, mm -hmm. who is maybe best known because of the way that his final poem survived. Uh, in the last year of his life, he was in a labor camp. He was on a forced march. He was shot into a mass grave. Throughout this whole period, which is about nine months, uh, he was writing poems in this little notebook. And when his body was unearthed from a mass grave a year and a half after he had been killed and after the war had ended, um, when they, when they you know, dug up his body, they, they found this little notebook in his pocket you know, soaked in his blood. And so his final poems come to us from beyond the grave. Uh, Rednoti, you know, lived at a time in, in Europe, you know, you got, you know, from, you know, the end of World War I until World War II, you know, you have an increasingly kind of fascist, nationalist, kind of anti-Semitic um, environment, not just Nazi Germany, but many other countries in Europe. Um, and it's kind of this rising tide of fascism and inhumanity that 
culminates in World War II um, and the Holocaust. And, you know, and, and Rodnoti, you know, at a certain point, he knew he was not going to survive. And yet he continued to write these poems in this little notebook. And at a certain point, he must have not even known if anybody was ever going to find these poems. And yet he continued to write them because he felt that it was important um, as, a, as, I guess, a personal act and, a, and, a, and an act of, of hope to kind of keep writing in the face of, of you know, darkness and in the face of death. Um, and so uh, I've all, I worked on this project and I connected with Fred Noti uh, and his work and I was inspired by him. And I, you know, I would think to myself, well, like, what am I having to deal with? You know, like I have no, nothing that compares to what he had to deal with, mm -hmm. you know, so what's my excuse? So I got I got to, you know, I got to like keep working and producing. I don't have an excuse. Um, anyway, so years later, uh, my friend George Peck, the Hungarian artist and I, uh, we both uh, saw these headlines from Europe that in Hungary, the proto-Nazi party that had taken over the government uh, was encouraging, you know, right-wing people in Hungary to burn the work of Jewish writers. And so there were these images that were coming out of Hungary of basically like lawn parties where Hungarian fascists would barbecue and then burn books. You know, it's like a, like a hot dog roast where at the end of it, you just take the work of Jewish writers and you just burn it in the backyard with your neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so it was, uh, you know, appalling uh, that this was happening and, and so banal because it really was like a bunch of guys in shorts, like drinking beer and burning books. And it was talking about the banality of evil. Um, mm -hmm. You know, anyway, so George and I were really upset by this and we decided we got to do, we got to create a work in response to this. And we decided, you know, we just, you know, we took the idea of book burning and we created Book Burn, which is uh, a video installation um, about the act of book burning that positions like kind of the audience member, like you're in the middle of, um, of a book burning. And then there's a companion piece, the library of books burned, uh, where we took the ashes of the burned books and we jarred them and we labeled each jar with the name of the book. And then we created like this library along the wall that's just the jar, jars of ashes that are the books that remain. Uh, and so the, the two pieces uh, are installed, you know, right next to each other. I mean, in the, in the museum, they were installed in the same room. So you have the projection that goes on like almost 360 and then along one wall, we had the library of books burned uh, just to make people think about the fact that this is still going on this the fact that you know that that um you know that that culture is being destroyed and there's a famous quote uh and i forget whose quote it is uh but the quote is uh uh wherever um wherever books are burned you know, humans will soon follow, you know? So like, you know, once you get to this burning book stage, then then afterwards that the next step is like the, the execution of people, you know, that's the next step in in kind of cultural wiping out and cultural genocide. Yeah, um, so let's, let's take a quick look at um, a video of a of, of book burn. Okay. The art of living, sources and observations of our residents. We hear about them first. Civilization and its discontent. Sigmund Freud. The interpretation of dreams. Sigmund Freud. Class of 1902. Yes. Yeah.
So yeah, that piece was really, really a moving piece. And, you know, when I saw it, just to sit there in the stillness of it and to realize that, you know, why you were doing it, um, it, 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 was, it was a bit chilling. So I just want to say as a side note, I really like that kind of um, extension of your creative uh, practice. And I hope that you do more art installations <laughs> because I really think, uh, you know, that's, that, that has an impact. So when you, so when I look at someone like you and it's a lot of the artists that I talk to, this is notion of having an action. Like what can you do as a creative person? Of course you have your practice as a filmmaker. Um, but there's also this notion of resistance and, and, and action, right? So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your growing up, right? You are the child of Cuban immigrants and a lot of your work now is, is you know, you have documentaries featuring, you know, Cuban, Cuban musicians, Cuban history, so on and so forth. Maybe can you tell, is there a, is, just tell us a little bit about that because I'm wondering, you know, obviously there's your family left, but you're, you know, you're, that, that's part of your blood, you know, um, so on and so forth. So uh, my family came over from Cuba in 1965, my parents, um, other members of my family before, some after. I was born in New York in 1971, and my parents shortly thereafter decided that uh, they needed to move to Miami, which is the cradle of Cuban civilization in the U.S., uh, so I grew up in an entirely Cuban community in Miami. Uh, I grew up with uh, my dad's dad and my mom's mom, uh, who both were avid readers and both uh, told me stories about Cuba. Um, my, my family, you know, my, my dad, my grandfather, and my uncle were all po political prisoners under Castro. My father never wanted to talk about that, but I knew that, you know, that that had happened. I knew that everything had been taken away from my family when they left the country. They'd had to like, kind of restart their lives. Uh, when I was growing up, I would say that I was upper lower class. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's how my parents would have seen it, but that's kind of, you know, like my dad was a bartender. My mom was a bookkeeper. There was never a lot of money. But it was also like a time and a place where, you know, we never really, we don't, never felt poor. Although I was aware that we didn't have as much money as other, as other people. Um, like, so for instance, when I went to high school, I went to a Jesuit high school. That's where like the kids of like the upper middle class would go. And so like everybody else's parents were lawyers and doctors, um, you know, I, you know, but I was like the poor kid whose dad was a bartender. Uh, so, but I was never, I think the resilience comes in, in that despite everything that my family went through, they had a great sense of humor about everything. Uh, they tried to protect us from the difficult aspects of life. Uh, but we were kind of taught like, you know, like bad stuff happens and you just, you try and enjoy your family and you try and enjoy, enjoy like your life, you know, like my dad never talked about being a political prisoner, but he loved to cook and he loved to host people. So he didn't have a lot of money, but at the drop of a hat, he would roast a pig for a group of friends in the backyard. And that was like a happy place for him. Uh, so I don't know, I guess the, like the notion of resilience that was instilled in me comes from like understanding the good things that you have in your life, you know, um, and appreciating you know, in my case, like my family, my friends, um, and just being able to like appreciate life. And then that, that forms the foundation 
that allows you to then like when you're starting to like get older and you deal with like a lot of you know <laughs> i mean like i don't know difficult stuff then you have a better appreciation of the fact that there is good stuff in your life you know um, i mean you often talk to me we've had these conversations of i don't know i don't know I don't know if I should use the word idyllic, but your childhood, I, I just get this image of you walking around, reading books, being very curious about everything. And this uh, Miami that I don't know if it exists anymore like that. The, the Miami of my childhood no longer exists because yeah. I was growing up in the 70s and early 80s when I was a kid and, and Miami was like 30 years behind everywhere else. And it kind of, you know, I watch Fellini movies where he shows his childhood when he like the 1930s Italy. And I'm like, yeah, that's what it was like growing up in Miami as a kid. <laughs> you know, it, it was a very tight knit community. It was all Cuban. Um, I, you know, before I went to, to college, I think there was one non-Cuban kid that, that I went to school with, Edward Zeissett in high school, <laughs> otherwise all Cuban. And there was only one uh, African-American kid uh, who was I was in school with in the fourth grade. His name is Andre. But other than that, we were all like these kind of like white Cuban kids, went to Catholic school. And it, it was like a really, I mean, really was like we grew up in a different country, you know? So I know technically in this in this country as, as a Cuban American, you know, as Latin, you know, we're Latinos and we're like in the minority, but I didn't really feel that. Um, and then when I went to college at that, you know, like by the age of 18, you know, it's like, then it's like, you're going to a different country. I went to Yale and it was like, I went to a different country, mm -hmm. you know, and then it was like, oh yeah, there are a lot of different people from everywhere here. And that was great. <laughs> you know? Um, so it was interesting because I, even though I was technically a minority, I did not grow up as a minority, you know? I mean, I grew up in a hundred percent, you know, Cuban community, mm -hmm. um, so I, I, in some ways, my experience is a lot, is closer to having grown up in like Latin America than having grown up, you know, Puerto Rican and New York or Mexican American and in California. Yeah, yeah. So, so having that um, relationship to being Cuban in in Miami, at what point did you begin to, uh, you know, claim the fact that you were an artist and particularly that you're a filmmaker, and then start to integrate that that heritage into your work, I would say, particularly in the documentaries that you've done uh, on Cuba? You know, it's interesting, because I didn't really have to, you know, because I grew up so in such a Cuban environment, I never felt like, well, that's not true. I mean, I, I did feel like I, want, I, I had never been to Cuba. And so I, there was some exploration of my identity where my family came from that needed to happen. But I didn't have, um, like I grew up with so much Cuban-ness inside of me that when I first started to create art, that wasn't where I needed to go. Mm -hmm. You know, because I was you trying to explore like, that, it was just God. You know, yeah, it was just kind of like, it wasn't until later that I started to, you know, like until I started to go to Cuba and get to know that experience that I, that I really started to um, like try and dig deeper there. You know, but initially the thing that got me into filmmaking, I mean, growing up reading books, I mean, there's a period of my life, you know, the 10 years or 12 years before I went to Yale where I was reading eight hours a day. You know, like I would go to the library as a kid, like eight years old, I'd bike to the library. They would allow me to check out six books. I would check out six books. I'd read them that night. And then I'd go back the next day and take out another six books. <laughs> you know, and then I I ran out of books to read at that library, so then my parents had to drive me wow. to the closest library. <laughs> and then you know, then I started to discover like book sales where I could go and buy like paperbacks for twenty five cents or fifty cents. And so I'd go to a book sale and go home with a stack of like a hundred books. Wow. You know, and so there's like, you know, I was kind of like a, a hermit for like ten or twelve years right before I went to Yale, where books was everything. But then right before I went to Yale, I saw a Charlie Chaplin Film Festival. And I, you know, like I fell in love. I was like, you know, I don't know. There was something about what he did that really um, inspired me. There's something so pure and so simple and so direct 
And I thought like, this is what I want to do. And so you probably remember when we were at Yale together, I was such a silent film nerd. Uh, and I made three silent film comedies that I starred in. So in a way, my career <laughs> started in the silent film era. But it was, it was a silent film era of my own making. Yeah. Um, and and it, it wasn't until after Yale, uh, a few years after Yale, you know, I graduated in 93 and then my father passed away that year. Uh, and three years later, I went to Cuba for the first time. And it was a very, you know, powerful trip to like get to go, you know, and it, and it kind of um, opened up. I had grown up Cuban. You know, so I went there and I immediately connected with this part of the family I had never met. I didn't feel like an outsider because we had the same culture, you know, but there was so much I learned, um, and, you know, and, and that was now 34 years ago. Mm. I've been to Cuba, I don't know, at least 50 or 60 times in the last five or six years until this, you know, like four or five times a year. I worked a lot down there um you know exploring the history you know i feel like now you know like when i was younger i knew that there were stories there and things that uh i wanted to to do but i didn't feel like i was quite ready yet mm -hmm. um, and now i feel like i'm finally at a point where i can i can go as deeply as i need to into certain things about culture and history uh, I feel like as a as an artist, I'm at a place where I know how to figure out the things I want to say, and I feel pretty confident in my voice. And so now these things that are very close to me uh, can be expressed in a way that um, you know will will be mean you know that I'll be happy with. Yeah, and I think too, writers often talk about you. Um, have to get to a certain age to actually have something to say. <laughs> so I think, you know, this kind of journey you've gone on or, 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 or continue to be on. I mean, one thing about the Cuban revolution is that the arts play a very significant part in that. And basically that, you know, arts were a basic human right which um, I'm not an expert. I don't know a lot about the Cuban revolu revolution. I really only know about it uh, tangentially through the, the, the arts com component of it. Um, and that always just connects to this idea of how artists are looking at the times that they're living in. But let's uh, switch a little bit, Hugo. What are you working on now? What's going on? What's, what's set up for the future for you? Uh, well, I'm uh, finishing up, well, I've, I've finished a documentary. Uh, my friend Catherine Zubek and I made a film, Once Upon a Time in Uganda. It's a documentary about Uganda's first action movie studio. Uh, and a group of, uh, of guys in the slums of Uganda that had made over 40 action movies with no money in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's also a story of my, my friend Alan, uh, sort of, um, uh, a uh, film nerd from New York who, you know, went there to find them and joined the circus and wow. became part of, you know, anyway, so that's, that was uh, uh, a great journey to go on. I guess everything, I've, a lot of the documentaries I've worked on have to do with people creating, you know, like poets yeah. writing poetry, singers, um, you know, music. And in this case, like, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, quote unquote, low art. Um, but uh, creating action movies, you know? Uh, and there's this kind of, when people are creating or sharing stories, I mean, there's something that's really cool about the way that they're, you know, connecting with the world. And so I'm just drawn to people that are, that are creating. Uh, and yeah, yeah. the other, uh, the, other um, the other film, which is not yet done, is the portrait of uh, Cuba's uh, greatest living singer, Omara Portuondo, who's like a Cuban Billie Holiday. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she's about to turn 90. So for the last couple of years, I've been filming her around the world uh, and kind of weaving together a portrait of, um, you know, this Afro-Cuban woman who had to like deal with a lot of stuff in her life and yet always, uh, I mean, just kept going. And 
you know, is really one of the great, um, you know, divas of Latin America. Uh, that one will be done later this year. And then I, you know, and then I have, uh, I, I may be working on a narrative feature this summer, loosely inspired by Fellini's La Dolce Vita. Uh, that would be uh, about a group of friends that are artists in New York this summer and how they, you know, deal with, you know, like in the face of COVID and Black Lives Matter and all this sort of stuff, you know, how, you know, can we keep creating in the same way? I mean, it's kind of like, you know, when you're as groups of artists, like you just want to keep going, right? And but yeah. sometimes certain things happen and they force you to like, like stop and reflect and figure out like, well, what is my responsibility at the moment? Exactly, yeah. You know, and and maybe at the end you decide like, you know what, my responsibility is just to keep creating art. You know, but maybe, you know, maybe it's like I got to stop and I got to figure out how I can be a part of what's going on. Or maybe there's a way to do both, you know, keep creating your art, but then also have it kind of reflect or be influenced by what's going on around you. So I don't know. That's, that's very, I'm still trying to figure it out, but I may be shooting that this summer sometime. That sounds amazing. I, I can already visualize you running around the city. <laughs> it's gonna be, I, want, I want it to be largely an improvised film. Yeah. Uh, I, I've got a group of actors that are all really excited to do it. And so it's kind of creating some scenarios and then, you know, establishing scenarios, putting the actors in place, saying action, and then shooting it like a documentary. Yeah, yeah. You know, so part of what I what, what I'm hearing is that you just talking about just keep going. But I think also what's important is to have the awareness, right? So if you say we're just going to keep moving forward and creating art, um, and sometimes you you're not aware necessarily of who's listening, and I think that's really important because what I'm finding out, even you know, just these little videos that I'm working on, that people will reach out and they'll say, you know, thank you for saying that or posting that. So as creative people, realizing that what you do is really important, is very necessary for kind of the fabric of, you know, what we're, of, of what we're trying, to, trying to achieve, particularly basic human rights, what we're looking at. So I want to kind of close up here, but I do have a few more questions for you. So as a creative person, um, you know, a lot of people, you've, you've, you have a long career, you have still a lot more, more to do. Do you have advice that you would give to people who are looking at, uh, you know, being a filmmaker, narrative, or a documentarian? I mean, you've also ex started to explore, you know, work in museums as well, which I think is really great. Uh, is there any advice you can give to people on that? On that? Um... Well, uh, be an enthusiast about everything that you do. You know, uh, don't do things that you're not excited about because you think that they're going to move you forward. Because uh, what I find is that the things that may help you along in your career, the things that are, I don't know, that you're doing because you love or because you're really excited by them or inspired. Um, you know, so that's the kind of first thing. You know, and, and, and when you're first starting out, nobody's going to give you a million dollars to go out and do something. So... I, luckily we live in a time when you can shoot a movie on your phone and edit it on your laptop and distribute it on Vimeo, you know, so I would say, uh, you know, just start producing, you know, don't, uh, don't get hung up waiting for somebody else to give you a green light or give you some funding. Just figure out what's a story that you can do, you know, with the resources that you have. I mean, if you have a few friends that are actors, you know, if you've got another friend who's got like a nice camera, you know, put them all together and go out and make a movie, you know, or if you are, you know, if you're a writer, um, you don't need other people, you know, just sit down and write um, and then worry about where you're going to publish later. You know, don't get hung up on like, oh, you know, like I got to write the great American novel, you know, just start writing and eventually you'll figure out what it is that what what it is that you're writing and like where to where to take it um you know so that's that's a couple of things i would say just be excited about what you do and and when you're first starting out do things that would are within your means or within your know, that you can do with the resources that you have because once you start to get in a position where you're waiting on other people 
to be able to start, you're never going to start. You're never going to start. So bottom line, just do it. Just, just do, do it. it. Yeah. And, 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 and keep, keep on keeping on for lack of a better term. Um, Hugo, tell us where we can find your work. What's your website? Uh, do you have social media posts? Where can we, uh, I am, I Netflix, am where, where do we go? <laughs> my website is currently down. Uh, let's okay. <laughs> see if be up again, M m30afilms.com. Uh, but I do, I do post uh, stuff on, uh, on Instagram and Facebook and, you know, I guess in the comments, maybe you can put those, my tags. I will do, definitely. So that, that's how I, and whatever I'm doing, that's, um, that's getting out there. That's how I let people know. Great. So again, Hugo, thank you for spending some time uh, with Revolutionary Daydreams today. And I will definitely put all that information in the comments so how we can find you. And um, to everyone, have a great day and I'll see you back next time. Bye-bye. Adios. Thank you for <laughs>